module 10 to 1 statistical studies on curve so so far we have discussed about corpus generation now we are trying to do certain amount of statistical analysis this is analysis part of corpus we are not going to produce some information uh, here in this discussion that is in the three two corpus rather we will be talking about some uh, statistical method or approaches that are being used on corpus and how they are actually helping us to understand the language properties usage patterns of language elements and other information of the language in a more so in this module we actually want to understand the nature of corpus study that includes the quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis then some history on how status has been used in earlier corpus study then what are the approaches normally are used in corpus studies and how in those things in conclusion how those things are going to contribute in understanding the language in a positive way so whenever we are talking about uh, corpus study nature of corpus study we say that corpus can be studied in two ways one is quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis qualitative is so a quantitative analysis in principle is basically having quantitative information about the various properties and the distributions of those properties in such a language suppose we have developed a corpus now we need to know various quantity information about uh, various properties of the language. If we have a corpus ready at our disposal, we are very much interested to know among those characters used on the language, which characters are more frequent in use, which are less frequent, and which almost all the time man maintain a balance in use. Suppose in English corpus, we need to know which are the most frequent characters used in the, in the corpus language. And also, we also need to know which are the most frequent words in the languages, which are the most frequent uh, nouns, verbs, adverbs, adjectives, or prepositions, or postpositions, or enclitics, or indefinable. Similarly, at the phoneme level, we meet, need to know which are most frequent, uh, say, vowels or diphthongs or consonants or among consonants, which are most frequent, uh, say, uh, velar sounds or palatal sounds or dental sounds or retroflex or sibilants or aspirates, non aspirates or voice sounds. So, we can have various uh, kinds of questions relating to quantitative analysis of text. So, we can carry out studies, particularly in a written text corpus, various types of quantitative analysis at various points. So, we need to under identify how those words or characters are distributed or items are distributed in the language. Let us take for time being that we are interested to identify how those characters or letters are used in the corpus. Our first question is which are the most important characters in this text and do the those characters which are most frequently found in this particular corpus or the other are actually representing the language or not. So, this is an important question. So, this is important to know because even from earlier days, this has been a very vital question because we need to know which characters are more frequent in the language, not only for simple addressing our simple queries about the language, but also developing, say, the computer keyboard layout design, the type keyboard layout, uh, type writer keyboard layout design, or for uh, Publishing purposes. So, the quantitative information about the character levels is very important. 
Now, if you go to the word of mouth of method, we also need to know which are most frequent words in the language and how they are distributed in the corpus. Which are the most inflected words, non inflected words, the most frequent nouns, non inflected, uh, uh, adverbs or adverbs or prospositions. So, what we have to do that we now need to understand not only at the word level, at the character level, at the phrase level, at the sentence level, and there are all types of things, even uh, in, in a larger string and larger text type also, in the paragraph level also, we identify different quantitative information about the about language properties. So, quantitative analysis has some importance. If we find that a particular character is most frequent, or a particular word is quite frequent, or a particular type of sentence construction is quite frequent in the language, we also need to know what kind of distribution it has, in what kind of environments it occurs, and does it have any impact on the language users as such, or on the particular text, or a particular um, job, or a particular type of text. So, a lot of issues would come into play. Uh, when you find out those results. So, quantitative analysis is only one part getting gathering information. We use various statistical models, statistical technique uh, to count the frequencies, to calculate the frequencies and identify the most frequent, less frequent, common, uncommon, all those things. Now, this is one side of the game. The other part is that we have got the information or quantitative information about the uh, distribution and occurrence frequencies of the linguistic properties. The other nature, the other side of the game is qualitative analysis. Now we are asking the question if this particular character or word or sentence is frequent, is it by choice? or by chance. That means, the reason behind this particular occurrence, particular phenomenon needs to be understood, explored and that there we now enter into the realm of qualitative analysis. Finding the frequencies or quantitative information is one thing, but that does not suffice. We also need to know why this particular thing is occurring like this. Why a particular character is quite frequent in the language? Does it have any advantage? Why a particular character is very less infrequent uh, use in occurrence? And if it is so, what might be the reasons? Is it by accidental or it is by choice or is there any other non-linguistic or extra-linguistic factors behind the frequency distribution of characters in the language? So, qualitative analysis qualitative analysis actually wants to identify the reasons behind this phenomenon, the factors responsible for the quantitative findings. Let us give some example that say uh, in Bangla, the most frequently used word is na, a negative word, no. So, our corpus analysis clearly showed that the word na has a very highest frequency of occurrence inside the Bangla corpus. So, this is almost we can find out that uh, in almost in every hundred words we get at least one or two na uh, occurring in the text. So, it has a very high frequency of occurrence and it comes to the first word in the list of the most frequently used words in Bangla. This quantitative finding has led us to explore, to understand why this is so frequent in the language. Also, qualitative analysis wants to understand that whether the word is always used in the same meaning, same sense in the text. Further analysis of data, we have noted that, okay, the word na is very frequent in the language all the time, but at the same time, it is not always used in a negative sense. Further analysis, qualitative study of the factors shows that 
there are many other factors, many other linguistic factors that are actually responsible for repetition, repetitive use, high use of the word and in most major cases, na is not used in the sense of negative sound. It is sometimes used in the sense of emphasis, in the sense of repetitions and mostly it is used in the sense of fillers. It does not have any specific markers, specific value, semantic load, semantic information, but it works as a filler in the sentences. So, this is basically a qualitative analysis of the texts, which has been triggered because of the quantitative findings. So, what happens here? Quantitative findings, quantitative data is uh, giving us a new insight into the, into the distributions of linguistic properties in the language, in the corpus or in the language and the supporting qualitative approach, qualitative findings to analysis also substantiate or refute or analyze or tries to explicate why that particular quantity of findings has been achieved. So, what we understand here very clear for us that neither the quantitative analysis nor the qualitative analysis can stand independently in understanding the language. So, when there are quantitative findings, statistical results, these results, these findings, these observations must be substantiated with qualitative analysis. So, what and why and how have to be combined together to actually understand the reality which has been manifested into the language. So, this we call a dual approach. That means, quantitative and qualitative analysis club together combined together, merge together to analyze the things, the phenomena, object. We need help of the statistics, we live, li need the help of mathematics, we need the help of computing to retrieve quantitative findings, to gather frequency information of various elements in the language. But those disciplines or people from those disciplines can help us to gather data in that way. I may not be equipped enough, I may not be uh, skilled enough to retrieve all the most frequent words in my in the Bangla TDM corpus. That may not be possible for me. So I can engage this computation person or a statistician who can quite elegantly handle the data and retrieve the data for me. Also, I can ask him to please find out the distribution patterns of the words, those be frequently used words in the text. So, a computer person or a statistician can do that for this purpose. This is one part of the game. Now, as a linguist, I need to explore the environments, the situations, the contexts where the words are used and to identify whether those statistical findings statistical observations, calculations, the mathematical numbers have any relevance in understanding the language. We also need to understand why a particular phenomenon is so frequent in a language and how it is having an impact in the intercognitive process of the language users. So, these are two important issues that are combined together in a dual approach scheme. So, we always encourage that while we are studying uh, corpus, finding out statistical information, mathematical information, quantitative data from the corpus, all the time that data must be substantiated with qualitative findings, qualitative analysis, without which statistical data has no value. Because statistical data may be sometimes misleading, sometimes not interpretative and sometimes give a false idea or wrong idea about a particular phenomenon, particular item, particular uh, entity or element used in the language. So, we always argue that all kinds of statistical quantitative results should be substantiated with qualitative findings. Now, here in the next part here, we would refer to some of the researches done on statistical studies 
on language. We'll go back, say, uh, in English sometimes, also some of the Indian languages, particularly in the cases of uh, developing uh, vocabulary list, basic vocabulary in Western world as well as in India, people have depended on uh, statistics. I mentioned about it in the cases of uh, Charles V when he was collecting data from different uses in English, American English, he used also some statistics to identify which are the most frequent words, most frequent letters that has to be included into the uh, basic vocabulary list or most frequently used word list to be used for language teaching purposes. That means certain amount of statistics are always used in linguistic studies. Even we can refer to the Haven, then Chambers, then Williams, then Dewey and Good and Miller and many other people who did these things did several kinds of statistics they have taken. And in recent times, after the development of corpus, we have come across many, many studies on, on, on corpora, English corpora, to find out which are the most frequently used characters, most frequently used words, frequently used prepositions, frequently used pronouns, British national corpus, American national corpus, and many other, even in Mank of English, that has been done. A similar thing has been taken place also in Indian languages. We have come across that uh, if we look at that uh, works of Sunit Kumar Chattopadha in his uh, famous magnum opus ODBL, he has, give, he has given a full description what are the vocabularies uh, come into the dictionary of a standard dictionary at that time available in 1971 which is today produced and he has given a full description over there what kind of words are there in the language and what are the percentage of these words in which frequency level they can be used. So, uh, it is not possible to give uh, to full descriptions or full details about different statistics being used. In some we can mention that literally in Europe and in many other in USA, but in many other languages also and many other different uh, areas of linguistic studies we use statistics and quantitative information, particularly developing the basic vocabulary, uh, developing the word book for the learners or graded vocabulary for the learners or even in stylometric, stylometric analysis or in stylo statistics, we also have full of information, quantitative information about the distribution patterns, about the usage, about the preference, about the constructions, constructions about the simplicity, about the authorship attributions even uh, in the area of readability of texts, we find that a lot of quantitative uh, studies are done. If we, uh, let me give one, one simple example here is that we recently have come across some studies where the readability uh, is measured on the number of words used in a sentence. It is noted that if a certain sentence is normally made with more simple words and the sentence constitute say around 10 to 12 words, it is more readable, more easily comprehensible, more easily understandable than a text which is say 50 words long and most of the words are multi, uh, having multi syllables or mm, longer words, multi characters. So, this, this finding shows that okay, readability of a particular text may depend on the simplicity and number of words if it is limited. So, quantity findings and qualitative findings has been combi combined together and history of linguistics shows that there have been many studies where statistics, mathematics are used to find out various distribution patterns, frequency of occurrences of various elements in the languages. After the compilation, of the data and after the implementation of various statistical approaches, the statistical methods in study of the words, we are now going to uh, discuss about the different approaches to statistical studies. So, there are three basic approaches. One is descriptive approach, second approach is say uh, inferential approach, 
entire approach is maybe uh, what should I say that is really the evaluative approach. So there is descriptive approach, uh, inferential approach, evaluative approach. There are different ways to treat the things. So in cases of depth treat approach, what happens here? Uh, in descriptive approaches, frequency counting is probably the most straightforward one. So in descriptive approach, we only describe things. We don't draw any inference or any conclusion or deduct nothing. We show that in this text, this is a this is the frequency, uh, this is the number of occurrences, this is the number of that element, this is the number of occurrence of that element. So what happens? The raw pure statistics retrieved from different angles, from different perspectives, different ways from the text are produced. In a tabulated form or in a much more sophisticated way to show that these are the number of words, number of tokens, number of infected words, number of non infected words, number of compound words, number of deduplicate words, number of phrases, number of idioms, number of noun phrases, verb phrases, uh, prepositional phrases or adjectival phrases or clauses or sentences, number of affirmative sentence, negative sentence, declarative sentence. Uh, interrogative sentence and all kinds of statistics. So, in descriptive stage, we only present these statistics, raw statistics, and nothing more. So, here we do a kind of corpus analysis, thorough corpus analysis from different angles, from different perspectives, keeping in mind if, uh, various goals with a desire to find out some crude or refined raw statistics from the data. So this is, up to this, this is the descriptive approach. The second part is inferential approaches. In inferential approach, we want to understand why this is so. That means, we observe the phenomena, we take into account the information generated in descriptive approach and we want to do a kind of significance testing. That means, we first want to understand if the frequency or mathematical counts or statistical counts of a particular feature is like this, then what kind of inference can be deducted from this information? And see how this inference is at all significant in the corpus under study in specific way and how this phenomena is or this information is significant to the language in general. So, there are two important parts. Suppose if we find that, let me give you a very concrete example. In the Bangla corpus, we found that the three synonymous forms of man, manus, lok, or john, or vekti, four forms, are, are quite frequently used in the language. And we found that Manus Lok has number of occurrences more frequent than Bhakti. Now we need to understand why Manus and Lok are more frequent in occurrence than Bhakti in the language. Even if we compare between the two Manus and Lok, we find that the word Lok is more frequent in the language than others. So, statistics descriptive approach says that okay, Lok is the most frequent form than Manus and Bhakti. That is one information we got it. Second time we wanted to know why Lok is more frequent. Is it because of uh, any hidden reasons about the preference of the term by the people? or the information actually embedded within the construction of the word or it is more informative or it refers 
many things that which uh, Manus fails to refer or it has a larger polysemic frame because of which it has high application potential. So, a lot of issues come into play to decide why this is so. It is also noted that the words have different patterns of distributions across different textiles. While we noted that the term manus has a more frequent occurrence in say formal kinds of texts, formal texts, the form lok has more frequent occurrences in many basically in informal texts. So, we find that and since informal texts are more number, more um, uh, uh, large in number, normally lok has a large occurrences in the language. So, this is one of the avenues through which we can explore why those two things are being developed, they are occurring in two different ways in the language. So, evaluative approach we are actually uh, uh, um, inferential approach, we are actually trying to test the significance of the occurrences of the terms in the language. So, there are many, uh, many statistical techniques like uh, sky square test, ANOVA test, Pearson correlation test, T test. So, a lot of statistics are there which are normally used to identify the significance testing. Then finally, we have got the evaluative approach. Evaluative approach actually uh, takes into account the sample subtext and multiple variables and cross compare those things. They see that whether this particular occurrence has any value can be generalized, can have greater uh, importance or implication in the text. Since uh, frequency tables taken from corpus often uh, hides many important ideas, more general patterns of similarities and differences underlying the linguistic patterns. So, we need to have uh, evaluative approaches to understand how those things are being distributed or distributed. So, tables is raw statistics and these are a lot of samples and a lot of variables, but in this case evaluative text we need to understand why such. So, evaluative statistical approaches help us to explain in a far better way, in a more significant way how some particular features varieties occur in a particular text, not in other text and how a particular feature is missing in other text, not in not occurring in the same frequency, same occurrences, same patterns. So, there are many, many some techniques like say uh, cluster analysis, then uh, factor analysis, multi-dimensional dimensional scaling, the log uh, uh, analysis. So, there are different ways, different statistical methods through which the evaluative uh, approach are used to understand. So, in evaluative approach, two things are actually basically done here that we want to understand why it is particularly regular, why it is not regular, why it is so frequent in one kind of text and why it is not available in other kind of texts. So, a lot of linguistic, uh, practical linguistic questions are also adequately approached. Uh, Mm, attested or addressed in these evaluative statistical approaches. If I refer to some of the examples that in 1993, uh, Biber used the factor analysis technique uh, into the English corpus to identify the relationship between the collocations of some homonymous words in English and to investigate their sense differences. So, it is a very important use of this evaluative approach to identify why those collocations, what kind of collocation relations actually de develop among the homonymous forms or what kind of semantic range the polysemous words can reveal uh, in distributions in the corpus. On the same time, McHenry and Wilson in 1996 used a multidimensional scaling to explore the relationship underlying different variables in the texts. So, uh, there are various ways, various evaluative approaches that normally used to analyze the text. So, in sum, uh, to in con conclude that uh, 
uh, what we understand that analysis of corpus and extracting information from corpus is not only the task of uh, only one linguist. linguist. So, since corpus are being used by multiple people for multiple purposes, uh, people require large amount of information, crude information, refined information, sophisticated information, scaled information, scroll information to analyze the corpus.